All right, students, it is Native American History Month, so we're going to talk in our doing history debate about Native American policies. Our key vocabulary for this assignment is assimilate. We need to find out what assimilation means. I want you to focus on the second definition here. To assimilate is to cause a person or group to become a part of a different society, country, etc. Schools were used to assimilate the children of immigrants. She was thoroughly, completely assimilated to her new country. So assimilation is the process of a person changing their culture, becoming part of a different society. If you go from one culture or one society to another, you've assimilated. In your own words, explain what it means to force someone to assimilate. We're going to follow that up with this question focus document. These were pictures taken at Carlisle Indian Boarding School. You'll learn about that in a little bit. Pictures from 1883 and 1886. What do you see in these photos from the 1880s? A group of three boys here, and three boys again. Sioux boys as they entered the school in 1883, and three years later. How might what we see happening here, a group of Native Americans who had changed their culture be related to what we might see today. Would this be an example of assimilation? Were these boys forced at this school to give up their culture? Is this something that Native Americans still resist, being forced to change their culture? After you've tried to make a connection between how this past document might help us understand a present problem, generate a question about the document. So we're going to learn about something called the Indian Child Welfare Act. We'll look at this article. It's about an adoption law that was created in the 1970s and being debated in the courts today. While we listen to it, we're trying to find out what the present situation is related to Native Americans as described in the article. We're looking for the lawyer of the Cherokee Nation, Chrissy Nemo, what she says about the history of assimilation and adoption of Native children. Where are these Native American children going when they are adopted? The U.S. government's relationship with Native American tribes has long been fraught, to say the least. A federal judge in Texas recently struck down a law that tries to ensure Native American children put up for adoption are paired with Native American families. The ruling reopens questions about Native identity and race-based preferences that many thought were settled decades ago. NPR's Wade Goodwin reports from Tahlequah, Oklahoma. In 2014, Paul Buckley and his wife Cheryl fostered a baby boy named Mason. We both have a, a heart for helping children, and it, it seemed like a way that we could provide something to the community and specifically to, to children. After raising Mason for a year and a half, the Buckleys decided to adopt. It was straightforward until late in the proceedings, the Choctaw Nation intervened on behalf of the child's great uncle. It turned out that Mason's mother, and therefore Mason, was part Indian. Mother had never mentioned this. 
Um, we had never been told that there was anything there. And, and Mason didn't even look uh, Indian in, in the least regards. M most everybody that was involved in the case was equally shocked. The legal proceedings were terminated and the adoption process started all over again, this time under the auspices of the Indian Child Welfare Act. The law says Native American children must be placed and adopted by either a family member, a member of their tribe, or failing that, a family from another tribe. This right here, what I've highlighted, is the key idea of this law, of the adoption law. It says Native American children must be placed with and adopted by a family member, a member of their tribe, or failing that, a family from another tribe. Why is there a federal law that tries to make it so Native American children who have to be adopted are going to be adopted by another Native American family? To understand why Indian adoptees are handled under different law than other children, it helps to know the history. Assimilation was the goal. We have these savage, uncivilized Indians, and we need to make them Americans. Chrissy Nemo is the Deputy Attorney General of the Cherokee Nation. About an hour east of Tulsa, the flat prairie of Oklahoma begins to pleasingly bubble into the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. In front of a packed house at the Cherokee Veteran Center, celebrated Cherokee flutist Tommy Wildcat plays for his tribe. Since being driven across the Trail of Tears 175 years ago at the point of a gun, Tahlequah, Oklahoma has become the center of the Cherokee Nation its music, its language, its culture, and its government. Cherokees constitute the largest tribe in the country, 360,000 strong. And it's therefore no surprise the nation's deputy attorney general is the lead attorney in the legal battle over the Indian Child Welfare Act. Nemo says the law was passed after more than a century of Indian children being taken from their tribes by whites. So we're going to take their children and we're going to train them in military boarding school. We're going to teach the girls to sew. We're going to teach the boys to work with their hands. And then they're going to go live in white American society and they're going to fit in with the rest of the country. And Indian tribes, as we know them, will be no longer. And so what we just learned about the history of, quote, adoption wasn't really adoption, just the process of taking Native American children away from their families forcing them into these boarding schools where, as you can tell, they're trying to basically disconnect them from their past culture and force them into white society. And Indian tribes, as we know them, will be no longer. This idea of assimilation in the past was that they are going to take the Native Americans and they're going to convert their children to, quote, Americans. Thousands of Native American children were put into government dormitories. At the U.S. Training and Industrial School, founded in 1879, the motto was, kill the Indian and save the man. By the late 1950s, an effort named the Indian Adoption Project began pairing Native American children with white families. At the time, it was considered enlightened adoption, white families open-minded enough to take Indian children. The deputy attorney general says there were advertisements in newspapers. We'll talk about this quote when we talk about the historic context. Just to give you an idea, it, so this would be a change from policies before 1879 where really war was always the solution that if the indigenous peoples were causing trouble, we're going to use the military to solve it. This idea in these boarding schools, what we're not going to try and kill 
the person, we're just going to kill their culture. Kill the Indian, save the man. It sounds pretty terrible, and it was. We'll learn about it later again. Basically, that you could buy an Indian child for $10. And there literally was this ad that Indian children were available for adoption, and for a $10 sponsorship fee, they would send you one. The Bureau of Indian Affairs would sometimes pay to place Native American children with white families. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had a robust Indian placement program. Thousands were adopted by LDS families. Nemo says tribes began looking around going, hey, where are all the children? One third of all Indian children in the United States had been removed from their parents, and between 80 and 90 percent of those had been placed in non-family, non-Indian homes. In 1978, with bipartisan support led by congressmen and senators from the western states, the Indian Child Welfare Act passed Congress and was signed into law. Okay. So, we've now heard about the situation where Native American children had historically, going back to the 19th century, been taken away from their families, their culture was torn away from them, and even more recently, Native American children were being removed from their families for foster care situations and then adoption, when their adoption was happening away from Native families. So we have thousands of Native American children being adopted by non-Native families. We learned earlier about the solution for the Indian Child Welfare Act, who is going to be able to first be the ones to adopt Native American children? What did we learn about the ICWA? In the article, we're going to keep learning about the lawsuits that are related to it today. Forty years later, at Cherokee Elementary School in Tahlequah, First graders are here in force, learning their native language. But in, but in October, U.S. District Judge Reed O'Connor struck down the Indian Child Welfare Act as unconstitutional. The Texas judge ruled the law is a racially based preference that discriminates against non-Indian families. The problem was that it was so poorly worded that it now inflicts harms on Indian children that it was supposed to protect. Timothy Sandifer is vice president for litigation at the Goldwater Institute in Phoenix. Sandifer filed a brief in support of striking down the law. We're working on a case right now in Ohio where there's a two-year-old boy born in Ohio, has lived in Ohio his entire life, almost his entire life with him. Foster family. But because his ancestry is Gila River, the Gila River Indian tribe in Arizona obtained an order from its own tribal court forcing the child to be sent to live on the reservation near Phoenix simply because the blood in his veins happens to have the required amount. That's unconstitutional and absurd. Remember Mason, the toddler that was about to be adopted by the Buckley family when his great uncle and the Choctaw Nation intervened? In the end, Mason did end up with the Buckleys. Why? Because the Indian Child Welfare Act allows the court's wiggle room if it's judged to be in the child's best interest. So why is it people are opposed to this? Why is it that they don't think the first in line to adopt should necessarily be Native Americans? They think it's in the child's best interest to get them adopted by who can adopt them. So, what does Timothy say about this? Don't focus on the unconstitutional part. Just think about how this, how they think this affects children. Plus, Mason's long relationship with the only family he'd ever really known decided it for the Buckleys. But this outcome was an exception. Most of the time, the law means Native American children are adopted by other tribal members or other Indians. There's a difference between being raised in your culture and then having to learn about it later. 
you lose the the protective factor, the the part that grounds you as a person when you have to learn about it through a book than if you have been raised that way. Julie Skinner is a Ponca Indian who was taken from her alcoholic parents as an infant and who then bounced around the Oklahoma foster system for years. Finally, her extended family, her father's cousins, used the Indian Child Welfare Act to gain custody of her. And so she grew up a Ponca. Now 41, Skinner gets emotional when she contemplates how the life she knows and loves likely never would have happened without that law. I think about what would happen if I hadn't been, sorry, yeah, I would not have, I would not be who I am. I feel like I owe everything to having been raised my culture. My, my, our belief system, our the spirituality of, of my tribe has been ingrained in everything I do. Is the Indian... Okay. How is what she just said about her culture and how her culture is, who she is, why do you think she and others support the Indian Child Welfare Act? Why do they think there should be a law that works to make sure Native American children are adopted by Native American families? Welfare Act, an unfair racial preference, or a legal acknowledgement that Indians have citizenship rights as both Americans and members of their sovereign tribes. For now, the law remains in effect. Earlier this month, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals stayed Judge Reed O'Connor's ruling while it takes up the case. Wait, good. Okay, so while the laws are debating, the, the legal system is debating, the Indian Child Welfare Act, do you think that it's in our country's best interest to uphold the Indian Child Welfare Act? Do you think we should have a law on the books that says Native American children who are up for adoption, the priority should be getting them placed and adopted by a family who is Native American? All right, our compelling policy question. What should be the goal of Native American policy? We're going to talk about Senate Bill 3645, the Indian Reorganization Act. An act to conserve and develop Indian lands and resources to extend to Indians the right to form businesses and other organizations and to establish a credit system for Indians to grant certain rights of home rule to Indians to provide for vocational and education for Indians and for other purposes. Okay, so now we're going to get into the meat of it. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled, that hereafter no land of any Indian reservation shall be allotted in severalty to any Indian. This allotment is something that we'll talk about in the historic context as well. We'll come back to that. Section 3. The Secretary of the Interior is hereby authorized to restore to tribal ownership the remaining surplus lands of any Indian reservation. So we'll learn that some land from Native American reservations was being sold. This is going to give that land back to the Native Americans. Except as herein provided, no sale of restricted Indian land shall be made or approved. Provided, however, that such lands or interests may be sold, devised, or otherwise transferred back to the Indian tribe. They are not going to sell any more Native American land. So we're seeing again and again that they're trying to protect the Native American's land. The Secretary of the Interior is hereby authorized to acquire any interest in lands, water rights, or surface rights to lands for the purpose of providing land for Indians. So not only are we going to stop the sale of Indian lands, we're going to try and give Indian lands back to them. Section 7, the Secretary of the Interior is hereby authorized to proclaim new Indian reservations on lands or to add such lands to existing reservations for the exclusive use of the Indians. All of our first sections here, we're seeing efforts to protect the land that is 
the Native Americans or rightfully belongs to the Native Americans. Section 10. Here is hereby authorized to be appropriated the sum of $10 million to make loans to Indian chartered corporations for the purpose of promoting the economic development of such tribes and their members. So we're going to have money to help them develop businesses. Section 11. There is hereby authorized to be appropriated $250,000 annually for loans to Indians for the payment of tuition and other expenses in recognized vocational and trade schools. $50,000 shall be available to, for loans to Indians in high schools and colleges. So we're going to try and give money to help educate Native Americans. Section 16, Indian Indian tribe or tribes residing on the same reservation shall have the right to organize for its common welfare and may adopt an appropriate constitution and bylaws, which shall become effective when ratified by a majority vote of the member, adult members of the tribe and approved by the Secretary of the Interior. Section 7, 16 is going to do is we're going to allow the Native Americans to create their own governments. Now, we should look at this and think to ourselves that, well, those groups have had their own governments for as long as they've been around. This is just going to add legality to those governments. The constitution adopted by said tribe shall also vest in such tribe or its tribal council the following rights and powers to employ legal counsel to prevent the sale, deposition, lease, or incumbents of tribal lands, interests in lands, or other tribal assets without the consent of the tribe, and to negotiate with the federal, state, and local governments. The Secretary of the Interior shall advise such tribe or its tribal council of all appropriation estimates on federal projects for the benefit of the tribe. Section 17. The Secretary of the Interior may, upon petition by at least one-third of the adult Indians, issue a charter of incorporation of such tribe, provided that such charter shall not become operative until ratified at a special election by a majority vote of the adult Indians living on the reservation. So, these governments, everything that is... Section 18, this act shall not apply to any reservation wherein a majority of the adult Indians shall vote against its application. So Section 18, it's nice to know that the government's going to let the decision actually rest with the people that it will affect. Section 19, the term Indian as used in this act shall include all persons of Indian descent who are members of any recognized Indian tribe now under federal jurisdiction, and all persons who are descendants of such members who were, on June 1st, 1934, residing within the present boundaries of any Indian reservation, and shall further exclude all other persons of one half or more Indian blood. For the purposes of this act, Eskimos and other Aboriginal peoples of Alaska shall be considered Indians. So all of these different pieces of the legislation it seems like the goals are to protect Native American lands. The goals are to allow them to be successful by funding businesses, by funding education, and to allow them to have control over their own government by helping them create their own governments. So it seems like to me the purpose of the Indian Reorganization Act is to give the Native American people more power over their future and protect them. So in the next part, in our historic context, we're going to go through a couple different phases of Native American policies in the United States to understand what led to the Indian Reorganization Act. So as we talk about the phases, you're going to, in each of these, write down what's most important about them. So 
So pre-contact, scholars believe between 4 and 20 million Native Americans lived in what is today the United States in 1492. Before Europeans arrived in the Americas, most tribes were communal. Individuals did not own the land. This was very different from Europeans' value of private property. However, it could be argued all 3 million square miles of today's continental United States belonged to the Native Americans. So before those European colonizers came here, how many Native Americans were there? And how much of the land belonged to them? 1492 Europeans arrived in America, claimed the right of discovery, arguing since they didn't think the natives were using the land to the fullest, the Europeans had a right to take it. This would be the very ethnocentric white Europeans came over, thought that their idea of land ownership was better, I guess you'd say, than the natives. Therefore, since they put their flag on it, they thought it meant it was theirs. Our next phase of coexistence with the United States from 1789 to 1828. When the United States won its independence, it became the job of the U.S. to determine policy towards natives rather than Great Britain. The U.S. government debated how much sovereignty tribes have and who would control Indian policies, the federal government or the states. Tribes were treated like foreign sovereign nations through negotiated treaties. However, the United States frequently used military force to subdue Native American tribes who fought against American encroachment on their lands. So in the early years of our republic, we really didn't know who was in charge of our relationships, our interactions with the Native Americans. We treated them like foreign countries, and it was our federal government's job. They negotiated treaties. However, we frequently used our military to solve our problems with the Native Americans. The Native Americans were continuously fighting to protect their lands from the encroachment of the whites. But what would happen would the whites would encroach on their land, natives would defend their land, then the United States military would come out to defend the whites who were more or less stealing the land of the natives. Our next phase of removal and reservations, 1829 to 1886. In 1823, the Supreme Court ruled in the first motion decision that Indians had some claim to land, but a less than right of discovery. The U.S. had absolute title, not the natives. The federal court says the land of the United States belongs to the United States, not the natives. Then in the 1830s, the Cherokee tribe, which had adopted white farming methods, laws, and even religion, was being forced out of Georgia to Indian territory in Oklahoma by the Georgia government. The Georgia government wanted the land because it was good land. They were trying to force them out. The Cherokee argued they were a sovereign nation based on treaties and should be treated like a state. They argued, we have papers saying... This is our land. We should treat it as such. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where Marshall said they are domestic, dependent nations and possess a right to self-government. He said the federal government, not the state of Georgia, governs the tribe. Georgia couldn't force the Cherokee off their land. And then, tragically, President Andrew Jackson supposedly says John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Jackson used the army to round up the Cherokee and march them to Oklahoma. This is known as the Trail of Tears. 4,000 Cherokee died on the forced march. This is some artwork depicting those Cherokee who were removed from the by the military to march all the way from Georgia to Oklahoma. Not all Native groups took this lightly. They grew tired of their treatment at the hands of the United States government. The Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, and Arapaho bands famously defeated George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn, also called the Battle of the Greasy Grass for the Natives. However, in most cases, the better-armed United States military defeated tribes who resisted. In 1877, after fighting to maintain their territory, 
Chief Joseph of Inez Pierce led his people on a retreat to Canada. They were caught, and he surrendered. He gave his I will fight no more forever speech. Basically said, all of the natives of my tribe, all of my people are dying. It's not worth resisting anymore because he doesn't want any more to die. Tragically, the United States military did not just use its military force against armed Native American warriors who were fighting them, but in a number of cases, turned their weapons on peaceful groups. Two famous examples include the Sand Creek and Wounded Creek massacres. In 1864, the 3rd Colorado Cavalry attacked an encampment of Cheyenne and Arapahoes, killing 230, of which over half were women and children. The leader of the cavalry, Colonel John M. Shivington, justified the attack by saying, Nitz mace lice. And this is just an absolutely horrible thing that was said did not justify the absolute horrible thing that was done. This encampment of Cheyennes and Arapahoes was a peaceful encampment and fire, they opened fire on them and he justified saying young Native Americans grow into old Native Americans who are then, I guess, more problematic to deal with. In 1890, the United States Cavalry attacked an encampment of Lakota who had refused to give up their weapons. In the end, an estimated 300 Lakota, including women and children, were killed. Massacres like these were justified by the ideas of men like General Philip Sheridan, who in 1869 said, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. This is a picture, a painting, from 1936 of the Sand Creek Massacre. U.S. forces surrounding Native American encampment opening fire on them. So clearly, this was a bloody and tragic time period and policy advanced by the United States government. Native Americans who had right to their land through treaty were forcefully removed from that land. And when removal did not go as desired by the federal government, violence was often used. Which brings us to our next phase of assimilation. While some in the United States government did not mind a policy of removal of natives and the wars and massacres that resulted from this policy, some people in America feared that was happening to Native Americans. Some came to believe that the best way to, quote, save the Indians was to assimilate them. This idea was best illustrated by Captain Richard H. Pratt, who opened Carlisle Boarding School in 1879. In an 1892 speech, he said his goal was to kill the Indian, save the man. So while this sounds horrible, if we are going to compare that to the American policy above, where they were frequently actually killing the Native peoples, does this sound better? It's still problematic. It's still horrible in many ways. But the idea that he doesn't think the outright slaughter of innocent peoples is the best policy. American Indian children were sometimes sent by their families to boarding schools, but were often forcefully removed. There were over 350 Native American boarding schools supported by the United States government. By 1900, there were Typo I have here. By 1900, there were 20,000 American Indian children living in Indian boarding schools. By 1925, that number had more than tripled. These boarding schools cut the students' hair, forced them to wear white clothes, and punished students for speaking their native languages or using their cultural practices. These Native Americans would be beaten if they spoke their language. Children were horribly abused in these situations. And the goal was to, as General Pratt said, kill the Indian and save the man. They come in, and so a quick side note, that the photographer who took all these pictures had costumes that he would dress 
the children in. Whether or not they look like this on arrival is kind of doubtful. But in order to dramatize the photos, he would dress them. One of the biggest assimilation policies was the Dawes Act in 1887. The Dawes Act divided up Native American reservations into allotments, turning tribal lands into private property. When we first started talking about Native Americans, we talked about the communal form of ownership of property. So a reservation was the tribe's land. It didn't belong to individuals. It belonged to the tribe as a whole. This is very different than European land ownership. So what they did was they took a reservation, they divided it up into individual pieces, and it became private property. They gave private property to each family of the tribe. This, the belief was this would make the natives give up their old ways and blend them into the rest of American society. However, leftover reservation land was sold to whites, which led to a massive land transfer from Native Americans to whites. In 1887, Native Americans had 154 million acres of land. Today it is 56.2 million. So we just need to look and see what happened to that amount of land that is owned by Native Americans. Right between here in the 1880s is when we have the Dawes Act, which, as you can tell, led to the loss of a lot of Native American land.